Hello there. This is a reading from my podcast called Down to Sleep, where I read books to you to help you fall asleep at night. There is a new episode every Monday on Spotify and podcast apps. If you enjoy this podcast, then please consider joining me on Patreon for a few dollars a month. You support the podcast, you get two readings a week, and you get access to every single episode so far at patreon.com slash down to sleep. Thank you. Now, let's tuck you in. Take a nice deep breath for me. Hit that like and subscribe. And let's get down to sleep. Toad, gay and irresponsible, was walking briskly along the high road, some miles from home. At first, he had taken bypaths and crossed many fields, and changed his course several times in case of pursuit. But now, feeling by this time safe from recapture, and the sun smiling brightly on him, and all of nature joining in a chorus of approval to the song of self-praise that his own heart was singing to him, he almost danced along the road in his satisfaction and conceit. Smart piece of work, that, he remarked to himself, chuckling. Brain against brute force, and brain came out on top, as it's bound to do. Poor old ratty. My, won't he catch it when Badger gets back? A worthy fellow ratty, with many good qualities, but very little intelligence and absolutely no education. I must take him in hand some day, see if I can make something of him. Filled full of conceited thoughts such as these, he strode along, his head in the air, until he reached a little town, where the sign of the Red Lion swinging across the road halfway down the main street reminded him that he had not breakfasted that day, and that he was exceedingly hungry after his long walk. He marched into the inn ordered the best luncheon that could be provided at so short notice, and sat down to eat it in the coffee room. He was about halfway through his meal, when an only too familiar sound approaching down the street made him start and fall a-trembling all over. The poop-poop drew nearer and nearer. The car could be heard to turn into the inn-yard, and come to a stop. Toad had to hold on to the leg of the table to conceal his overmastering emotion. Presently, the party entered the coffee room. Hungry, talkative and gay, voluble on their experiences of the morning and merits of the chariot that had brought them along so well. Toad listened eagerly, all ears for a time, At last he could stand it no longer. He slipped out of the room quietly, paid his bill at the bar, and as soon as he got outside, sauntered round quietly to the inn-yard. There cannot be any harm, he said to himself, in my only just looking at it. The car stood in the middle of the yard, quite unattended, the stable helps and the other hangers-on being all at their dinner. Toad walked slowly round it, inspecting, criticizing, musing deeply. I wonder, he said to himself presently, I wonder if this sort of car starts easily. Next moment, hardly knowing how it came about, he found he had hold of the handle and was turning it. As the familiar sound broke forth, the old passion seized on Toad and completely mastered him, body and soul. As if in a dream, he found himself somehow seated in the old driver's seat. As if in a dream, he pulled the lever and swung the car round the yard and out through the archway. And as if in a dream, all sense of right and wrong, all fear of obvious consequences, seemed temporarily suspended. He increased his pace, and as the car devoured the street and leapt forth on the high road through the open country, he was only conscious that he was Toad once more, Toad at his best and highest, Toad the terror, the traffic queller, the lord of the lone trail, before whom all must give way or be smitten into nothingness and everlasting night. He chanted as he flew and the car responded with sonorous drone. 
the miles were eaten up under him as he sped, he knew not whither, fulfilling his instincts, living his hour, reckless of what might come to him. To my mind, observed the chairman of the bench of magistrates cheerfully, the only difficulty that presents itself in this otherwise very clear case is how we can possibly make it sufficiently hot for the incorrigible rogue and hardened ruffian whom we see cowering in the dock before us. Let me see. He has been found guilty, on the clearest evidence first, of stealing a valuable motor car, secondly, of driving to public danger, thirdly, of gross impertinence to the rural police. Mr. Clerk, will you tell us, please, what is the very stiffest penalty that we can impose for each of these offences, without, of course, giving the prisoner the benefit of any doubt, because there isn't any? The clerk scratched his nose with his pen. Mm, some people would consider, he observed, that stealing the motor car was the worst offence, and so it is. But cheek in the police undoubtedly carries the severest penalty, and so it ought. Supposing you were to say twelve months for the theft, which is mild, and three years for the furious driving, which is lenient, and fifteen years for the cheek, which was pretty bad, sort of cheek, judging by what we've heard from the witness box, even if you only believe one-tenth of what you heard, and I never believe more myself, those figures, if added together correctly, are tot up to nineteen years. First rate, said the chairman. So you'd better make it round twenty years and be on the safe side, concluded the clerk. An excellent suggestion, said the chairman approvingly. Prisoner, pull yourself together and try and stand up straight. It's going to be twenty years for you this time. And mind, if you appear before us again, upon any charge whatever, we shall have to deal with you very seriously. Then the brutal minions of the law fell upon the hapless toad, loaded him with chains, and dragged him from the courthouse, shrieking, praying, protesting, across the marketplace, where the playful populace, always as severe upon detected crime as they are sympathetic and helpful when one is merely wanted, assailed him with jeers, carrots, and popular catchwords past hooting school children, that their innocent faces lit up with pleasure they ever derive from the sight of a gentleman in difficulties. Across the hollow-sounding drawbridge, below the spiky portcullis, under the frowning archway of the old grim castle, whose ancient towers soared high overhead, past guardrooms full of grinning soldiery off-duty, past sentries who coughed in a horrid, sarcastic way, because that is as much as a sentry on his post dare do to show his contempt and abhorrence of crime. Up time-worn winding stairs, past men-at-arms, where mastiffs strained at their leash and poured the air to get to him, past ancient warders, their halberds leant against the wall, dozing over a pasty in a flagon of brown ale, on and on, past the rack chamber and the thumbscrew room, past the turning that led to the private scaffold, till they reached the door of the grimmest dungeon that lay in the heart of the innermost keep. There at last they paused, where an ancient jailer sat, fingering a bunch of mighty keys. Odds bodikins, said the sergeant of police, taking off his helmet and wiping his forehead. Ruth the old loon, take over from us this vile toad, a criminal of deepest guilt, matchless artfulness and resource. Watch and ward him with all thy skill, and mark thee well, greybeard. Should all untoward befall, thy old head shall answer for this and a murrain on both of them. The jailer nodded grimly, laying his withered hand on the shoulder of the miserable toad. The rusty key creaked in the lock. The great door clanged behind them. 
Toad was a helpless prisoner in the remotest dungeon of the best guarded keep of the stoutest castle in all the length and breadth of Merry England. Chapter 7 The Piper at the Gates of Dawn The Willow Wren was twittering his thin little song, hidden himself in the dark selvage of the riverbank. Though it was past ten o'clock at night, the sky still clung to and retained some lingering skirts of light from the departed day. The sullen heats of the torrid afternoon broke up and rolled away at the dispersing touch of the cool fingers of a short midsummer night. Mole lay stretched on the bank, still panting from the stress of the fierce day that had been cloudless from dawn to late sunset, and waited for his friend to return. He had been on the river with some companions, leaving the water rat free to keep an engagement of long-standing with the otter. He had come back to find the house dark and deserted, and no sign of rat, who was doubtless keeping it up late with his old comrade. It was still too hot to think of staying indoors, so he lay on some cool dock leaves and thought over the past day and its doings, and how very good they all had been. The rat's light footfall was presently heard, approaching over parched grass. Oh, the blessed coolness, he said, and sat down, gazing thoughtfully into the river, silent and preoccupied. You stayed supper, of course, said the mole presently. Simply had to, said the rat. They wouldn't hear of my going before. You know how kind they always are, and they made things as jolly for me as they ever could, right up to the moment I left. But I felt a brute all the time, as it was clear to me they were very unhappy, though they tried to hide it. Mole, I'm afraid they're in trouble. Little Portly's missing again, and you know what a lot his father thinks of him, though he never says much about it. What? The child, said the Mole lightly. Well, I, I suppose he is. Why worry about it? He's always straying off and getting lost, and turning up again. He's so adventurous, but no harm ever comes to him. Everybody hereabouts knows him and likes him, just as they do the old otter. You may be sure some animal or other will come across him and bring him back again all right. Why, we've made him ourselves miles from home and quite self-possessed and cheerful. Yeah, but this time it's more serious, said the rat gravely. He's been missing for some days now and the otters have hunted everywhere high and low, without finding the slightest trace. They've asked every animal for miles around. No one knows anything about him. Otter's evidently more anxious than he'll admit. I got out of him that young Portly hasn't learnt to swim very well yet, but I can see he's thinking of the weir. There's a lot of water coming down still, considering the time of the year, and the place always had a fascination for the child. Then there are, well traps and things, you know. Otter's not the fellow to be nervous about any son of his before it's time. And now he is nervous. When I left, he came out with me, said he wanted some air and talked about stretching his legs. But I could see that it wasn't that. So I drew him out and I pumped him and got all of it from him at last. He was going to spend the night watching by the ford. You know the place where the old ford used to be? in bygone days before they built the bridge. I, I know it well, said the mole. But why should Otter choose to watch there? Well, it seems that it was there that he gave Portly his first swimming lesson, from the shallow, gravelly spit near the bank. And it was there that he used to teach him fishing. And there young Portly caught his first fish, of which he was so very proud. The child loved the spot. And Otter thinks that if he came wandering back from wherever he is, if he is anywhere by this time, poor little chap, he might make for the ford that he was so fond of. Or if he came across it, he'd remember it 
and stop there and play, perhaps. So Otto goes there every night and watches. On the chance, you know. Just on the chance. They were silent for a time, both thinking the same thing. The lonely heart sore animal crouched by the ford, watching and waiting the long night through on a chance. Well, said the rat presently, I suppose we ought to be thinking about turning in, but he never offered to move. Rat, said the mole, I simply can't go and turn in and go to sleep and do nothing, even though there doesn't seem to be anything to be done. We'll get the boat out, we'll, we'll paddle upstream, the moon will be up in an hour or so, and we'll search as well as we can. Anyhow, it'll be better than going to bed and doing nothing. Just what I was thinking myself, said the rat. It's not the sort of night for bed, anyhow, and daybreak's not so very far off. Then we may pick up some news of him from early risers as we go along. They got the boat out, and the rat took the skulls, paddling with caution. Out in midstream, there was a clear, narrow track that faintly reflected the sky, but wherever shadows fell on the water from bank, bush, or tree, they were as solid to all appearance as the banks themselves. The mole had to steer with judgment accordingly. Dark and deserted as it was, the night was full of small noises, song and chatter and rustling, telling of the busy little population who were up and about, plying their trades and vocations through the night until sunshine should fall on them and send them off at last to their well-earned repose. The water's own noises, too, were more apparent than by day. Its gurglings and cloops more unexpected and near at hand, and constantly they started at what seemed a sudden clear call from an actual articulate voice. The line of the horizon was clear and hard against the sky, and in one particular quarter it showed black against a silvery climbing phosphorence that grew and grew. At last, over the rim of the waiting earth, the moon lifted with slow majesty until it swung clear of the horizon and rode off free of moon rings. Once more they began to see surfaces, meadows widespread and quiet gardens, the river itself from bank to bank, all of it softly disclosed, all washed clean of mystery and terror, all radiant again as by day, but with a difference that was tremendous. Their old haunts greeted them again in other raiment, as if they had slipped away and put on this pure new apparel and come quietly back, smiling as they shyly waited to see if they would be recognized again. Fastening their boat to a willow, the friends landed in this silent silver kingdom and patiently explored the hedges, the hollow trees, the runnels and their little culverts, the ditches, the dry waterways, before embarking again and crossing over. They worked their way up the stream in this manner, while the moon, serene and detached in a cloudless sky, did what she could, though so far off to help them in their quest, till her hour came and she sank earthwards, reluctantly, and left them. The mystery once more held field and river. Then a change began slowly to declare itself. The horizon became clearer. Field and tree came more into sight, and somehow with a different look. The mystery began to drop away from them. A bird piped suddenly and was still. A light breeze sprang up and set the reeds and bulrushes rustling. Rat, who was at the stern of the boat, while Mole sculled, sat up and listened with a passionate intentness. 
Mole, with gentle strokes, was keeping the boat moving while he scanned the banks with care, looked at him with curiosity. It's gone, sighed the rat, sinking back into his seat again. So beautiful and strange and new. Since it was to end so soon, I almost wish I had never heard it, for it has roused a longing in me that is pain. But nothing seems worthwhile but just to hear that sound once more and go on listening to it forever. No, there it is again. Alert once more, entranced, he was silent for a long space, spellbound. Now it passes on and I begin to lose it. Oh, mull the beauty of it, the merry bubble and joy, the thin, clear, happy call of distant piping. Such music I never dreamed of, and the call in it is stronger even than the music is sweet. Row on, mull, row. For the music and the cool must be for us. The mole, greatly wondering, obeyed. I hear nothing myself, he said, but the wind playing in the reeds, the rushes. The rat never answered, if indeed he heard. Wrapped, transported, trembling, he was possessed in all his senses by this new divine thing that caught his helpless soul, and swung and dandled it, a powerless but happy infant in a strong, sustaining grasp. In silence, Mole rode steadily, and soon they came to a point where the river divided, a long backwater branching off to one side. With a slight movement of his head, Rat, who had long dropped the rudder lines, directed the rower to take the backwater. The creeping tide of light gained and gained, and now they could see the colour of the flowers that gemmed the water's edge. Clearer and nearer still, cried the rat joyously. Now you must surely hear it. At last, I see that you do. Breathless and transfixed, the mole stopped rowing as the liquid run of that glad piping broke on him like a wave, caught him up and possessed him utterly. He saw the tears on his comrade's cheeks and bowed his head and understood. For a space they hung there, brushed by the purple loose strife that fringed the bank. Then the clear imperious summons that marched hand in hand with intoxicating melody imposed its will on Mole, and mechanically he bent to his oars again. The light grew steadily stronger, but no birds sang as they were wont to do at the approach of dawn, and but for the heavenly music all was marvellously still. On either side of them, as they glided onwards, the rich meadow grass seemed that morning of a freshness and a greenness unsurpassable. Never had they noticed the roses so vivid, the willow herb so riotous, the meadow sweet so odorous and pervading. Then the murmur of the approaching weir began to hold the air. They felt a consciousness that they were nearing the end, whatever it might be, that surely awaited this expedition. A wide half-circle of foam and glinting lights and shining shoulders of green water. The great weir closed the backwater from bank to bank, troubled all the quiet surface with twirling eddies and floating foam streaks. It deadened all other sounds with its solemn and soothing rumble. In midmost of the stream, embraced in the weir's shimmering arm spread, a small island lay anchored, fringed close with willow and silver birch, reserved, shy, but full of significance. It hid whatever it might hold behind a veil, keeping it till the hour should come, and with the hour, those who were called and chosen. Slowly, but with no doubt or hesitation whatever, 
and in something of solemn expectancy. The two animals passed through the broken, tumultuous water, and moored their boat at the flowery margin of the island. In silence they landed, and pushed through the blossom and scented herbage and undergrowth that led up to level ground, till they stood on a little lawn of marvellous green, set round with nature's own orchard trees, crabapple, wild cherry, and sloe. This is the place of my song dream, the place the music played to me, whispered the rat, as if in a trance. Here in this holy place, here if anywhere, surely we shall find him. Then, suddenly, the mole felt a great awe fall upon him, an awe that turned his muscles to water, bowed his head, rooted his feet to the ground. It was no panic terror, indeed he felt wonderfully at peace and happy but it was an awe that smote and held him, and without seeing he knew that it could only mean that some august presence was very, very near. With difficulty he turned to look for his friend, and saw him at the side, cowed, stricken, trembling violently. And still there was utter silence in the populous bird-haunted branches around them. Still the light grew and grew, Perhaps he would never have dared to raise his eyes, but that though the piping was now hushed, the call and the summons seemed still dominant and imperious. He might not refuse with death himself waiting to strike him instantly once he had looked with mortal eye on things rightfully kept hidden. Trembling, he obeyed and raised his humble head, and then... In the utter clearness of imminent dawn, while nature, flushed with fullness of incredible colour, seemed to hold her breath for the event, he looked in the very eyes of the friend and helper, saw the backward sweep of the curved horns gleaming in the growing daylight, saw the stern hooked nose between kindly eyes that were looking down on them humorously while the bearded mouth broke into a half-smile at the corners, saw the rippling muscles on the arm that lay across the broad chest, the long, supple hand holding panpipes only just fallen away from parted lips, saw the splendid curves of the shaggy limbs disposed in majestic ease on the sword, saw last of all, nestling between his very hooves, sleeping soundly in entire peace and contentment, the little round podgy childish form of the baby otter. All this he saw for one moment, breathless and intense, vivid on the morning sky, and still as he looked, he lived, and still as he lived, he wondered. Rat, he found breath to whisper, shaking. Are you afraid? Afraid, murmured the rat, his eyes shining with unutterable love. Afraid of him? Never, never. And yet, oh, Mole, I am afraid. The two animals crouched to the earth, bowed their heads and did worship. Sudden and magnificent, the sun's broad golden disk showed itself over the horizon facing them. The first rays shooting across the level water meadows, taking the animals full in the eyes and dazzling them. When they were able to look once more, the vision had vanished. The air was full of the carol of birds that hailed the dawn. As they stared blankly in dumb misery deepening, as they slowly realized all they had seen and all they had lost. A capricious little breeze, dancing up from the surface of the water, tossed the aspens, shook the dewy roses, and blew lightly and caressing in their faces. And with its soft touch came instant oblivion. For this is the last best gift that the kindly demigod 
is careful to bestow on those to whom he has revealed himself in their helping the gift of forgetfulness, lest the awful remembrance should remain and grow and overshadow mirth and pleasure, that the great haunting memory should spoil all the afterlives of little animals helped out of difficulties, in order that they should be happy and light-hearted as before. Mole rubbed his eyes and stared at Rat, who was looking about him in a puzzled sort of way. Mm. I beg your pardon, what did you say, Rat? he asked. I think I was only remarking, he said slowly, that this was the right sort of place, and that here, if anywhere, we should find him. And look, why, there he is, the little fellow. And with a cry of delight, he ran towards the slumbering portly. But Mole stood still a moment, held in thought as one wakened suddenly from a beautiful dream struggling to recall it, and can recapture nothing but a dim sense of the beauty of it, the beauty, till that too fades away in its turn, and the dreamer bitterly accepts the hard, cold waking and all of its penalties. So Mole, after struggling with his memory for a brief space, shook his head sadly and followed the rat. Portly woke up with a joyous squeak, and wriggled with pleasure at the sight of his father's friends, who had played with him so often in the past days. In a moment, however, his face grew blank. He fell to hunting round in a circle with a pleading whine, as a child that has fallen happily asleep in its nurse's arms, and wakes to find itself alone and laid in a strange place searching corners and cupboards, running from room to room, despair growing silently in its heart. Even so, Portly searched the island and searched, dogged and unwearying, till at last the black moment came for giving it up, and sitting down, and crying bitterly. The mole ran quickly to comfort the little animal, but Rat lingering looked long and doubtfully at certain hoof marks deep in the sward. Some great animal's been here, he murmured slowly and thoughtfully, and stood musing, musing, his mind strangely stirred. Come along, Rat, called the Mole. Think of poor Otter waiting up there by the ford. Portly had soon been comforted by the promise of a treat, a jaunt on the river in Mr. Rat's real boat, and the two animals conducted him to the waterside, placed him securely between them in the bottom of the boat, and paddled off down the backwater. The sun was fully up by now and hot on them. Birds sang lustily and without restraint, and flowers smiled and nodded from either bank. But somehow, so thought the animals, with less of the richness and blaze of colour that they seemed to remember. They wondered where they had seen them recently. The main river reached again, they turned the boat's head upstream, towards the point where they knew their friend was keeping his lonely vigil. As they drew near the familiar ford, the mole took the boat into the bank. They lifted poorly out and set him on his legs on the towpath giving him his marching orders and a friendly farewell pat on the back. They watched the little animal as he waddled along the path contentedly and with importance. They watched him till they saw his muzzle lift and his waddle break into a clumsy amble. He quickened his pace with shrill whines and wriggles of recognition, looking up the river. They could see Otter start up, tense and rigid, from out of the shallows where he crouched in dumb patience, and could hear his amazed and joyous bark as he bounded up to the path. Mole, with a strong pull on one oar, swung the boat around and let the full stream bear them down again, whither it would 
their quest happily ended. I feel strangely tired, Rat, said the Mole, leaning wearily over his oars as the boat drifted. It's been up all night, you'll say, perhaps, but that's nothing. We do as much half the nights of the week at this time of year. No, I feel as if I've been through something very exciting and rather terrible, and it was just over and yet nothing particular has happened. Or something very surprising and splendid and beautiful, murmured the rat, leaning back and closing his eyes. I feel just as you do, Mole. Simply dead tired, though not body tired. It's lucky we've got the stream with us to take us home. Isn't it jolly to feel the sun again, soaking into one's bones? Hark to the wind playing in the reeds. It's like music, far away music, said the mole, nodding drowsily. So I was thinking, murmured the rat, dreamful and languid. Dance music. The lilting sort that runs on without a stop, but with words in it, too. It passed into words and out of them again. I, I catch them at intervals. Then it's dance music one once more, and then nothing but reeds, soft, thin, whispering. You hear better than I, said the mole, sadly. I cannot catch the words. Let me try and give you them, said the rat softly his eyes still closed. Now it's turning into words again, faint but clear. Lest the oar should dwell and turn your frolic to fret, you shall look on my power at the helping hour, but then you shall forget. Now the reeds take it up. Forget, forget, they sigh. And it dies away in a rustle and a whisper and then the voice returns. Lest limbs be reddened and rent, I spring the trap that is set. As I loose the snare, you may glimpse me there, for surely you shall forget. Row nearer, Mole, nearer to the reeds. It's, it's hard to catch, and it grows each minute fainter. Helper and helper, I cheer. Small waifs in the woodland wet, Strays I find in it, Wounds I bind in it, Binding them all forget. Nearer, Mole, nearer. No, oh, it's no good. The songs died away. What do the words mean? Asked the wondering Mole. That I do not know, Said the Rat simply. I passed them on to you as they reached me. Now they return again, this time full and clear. This time at last, it's the real, unmistakable thing. Simple, passionate, perfect. Well, let's have it then, said the Mole, after he waited patiently for a few minutes, half dozing in the hot sun. But no answer came. He looked and understood the silence. With a smile of much happiness on his face, and something of a listening look still lingering there, the weary rat was fast asleep. When Toad found himself immured in a dank and noisome dungeon, and knew that all the grim darkness of a medieval fortress lay between him and the outer world of sunshine, and the well-metalled high roads where he had lately been so happy, disporting himself as if he had bought up every road in England. He flung himself at full length on the floor and shed bitter tears. He abandoned himself to dark despair. This is the end of everything, he said. At least, it is the end of the career of Toad, which is the same thing. The popular and handsome Toad, the rich and hospitable Toad, the Toad so free and careless and debonair. How can I hope to be 
ever set at large again, who have been imprisoned so justly for stealing so handsome a motor car in such an audacious manner, and for such lurid and imaginative cheek bestowed upon such a number of fat red-faced policemen. Here his sobs choked him. Stupid animal that I was. Now I must languish in this dungeon, till people who were proud to say they knew me have forgotten the very name of Toad. Oh, wise old badger. Oh, clever, intelligent rat. Sensible mole. What sound judgments. What a knowledge of men and matters you possess. Oh, unhappy and forsaken Toad. With lamentations such as these, he passed his days and nights for several weeks, refusing his meals or intermediate light refreshments, though the grim and ancient jailer, knowing that Toad's pockets were well lined, frequently pointed out that many comforts, and indeed luxuries, could be by arrangement sent in, at a price, from outside. Now the jailer had a daughter, a pleasant wench and good-hearted, who assisted her father in the lighter duties of his post. She was particularly fond of animals, and besides her canary, whose cage hung on a nail in the massive wall of the keep by day, to the great annoyance of prisoners who relished an after-dinner nap, she kept several piebald mice and a restless revolving squirrel. This kind-hearted girl, pitying the misery of Toad, said to her father one day, Father, I can't bear to see that poor beast so unhappy and getting so thin. You let me have the managing of him. You know how fond of animals I am. I'll make him eat from my hand and sit up and do all sorts of things. Her father replied that she could do what she liked with him. He was tired of Toad, and his sulks and his airs and his meanness. So that day, she went on her errand of mercy, and knocked at the door of Toad's cell. Now, cheer up, Toad, she said, coaxingly on entering. Sit up and dry your eyes and be a sensible animal, and do try to eat a bit of dinner. See? I've brought you some of mine, hot from the oven. It was bubble and squeak between two plates, and its fragrance filled the narrow cell. The penetrating smell of cabbage reached the nose of Toad as he lay prostrate in his misery on the floor. It gave him the idea for a moment that perhaps life was not such a blank and desperate thing as he had imagined. But still he wailed and kicked his legs and refused to be comforted. So the wise girl retired for the time. But of course, a good deal of the smell of hot cabbage remained behind, as it will do. And Toad, between his sobs, sniffed and reflected, and gradually began to think new and inspiring thoughts of chivalry and poetry, deeds still to be done, of broad meadows and cattle browsing in them, raked by sun and wind, of kitchen gardens and straight herb borders, warm snapdragon beset by bees, and the comforting clink of dishes set down on the table at Toad Hall. The scrape of chair legs on the floor as everyone pulled himself up close to his work. The air of the narrow cell took a rosy tinge. He began to think of his friends, how they would surely be able to do something. Of lawyers, how they would have enjoyed his case. What an ass he had been not to get in a few. And lastly, he thought of his own great cleverness and resource and all that he was capable of if only he gave his great mind to it. The cure was almost complete. When the girl returned some hours later, she carried a tray with a cup of fragrant tea steaming on it, and a plate piled up with very hot buttered toast, cut thick, very brown on both sides, 
with the butter running through the holes in it, great golden drops like honey from the honeycomb. The smell of that buttered toast simply talked to Toad, and with no uncertain voice it talked of warm kitchens, of breakfasts on bright frosty mornings, of cosy parlour firesides on winter evenings. When one's ramble was over and slippered feet were propped on the fender, of the purring of contented cats, and the twitter of sleepy canaries. Toad sat up on end once more, dried his eyes, sipped his tea, and munched his toast. Soon he began talking freely about himself, and the house that he lived in, and his doings there, and how important he was, and what a lot his friends thought of him. The jailer's daughter saw that the topic was doing him as much good as the tea, as indeed it was, and encouraged him to go on. Tell me about Toad Hall, said she. It sounds beautiful. Toad Hall, said the Toad proudly, is an eligible, self-contained gentleman's residence, very unique, dating in part from the 14th century, but replete with every modern convenience. Up-to-date sanitation, five minutes from church, post office, and golf links. Suitable for... Bless the animal, said the girl, laughing. I don't want to take it. Tell me something real about it. But first, wait till I fetch you some more tea and toast. She tripped away, and presently returned with a fresh trayful. And Toad, pitching into the toast with avidity his spirits quite restored to their usual level, told her about the boathouse and the fish pond, the old walled kitchen garden, about the pigsties and the stables and the pigeon house and the hen house, about the dairy, the wash house and the china cupboards, and the linen presses, she liked that bit especially, and about the banqueting halls and the fun that they had there when the other animals were gathered round the table and Toad was at his best singing songs, telling stories, carrying on generally. Then she wanted to know about his animal friends, and was very interested in all that he had to tell her about them and how they lived, and what they did to pass their time. Of course, she did not say that she was fond of animals as pets, because she had the sense to see that Toad would be extremely offended. When she said good night, having filled his water jug and shaken up his straw for him, Toad was very much the same sanguine, self-satisfied animal that he had been of old. He sang a little song or two, of the sort that he used to sing at his dinner parties, curled himself up in the straw, and had an excellent night's rest, and the pleasantest of dreams. They had many interesting talks together after that. As the dreary days went on, and the jailer's daughter grew very sorry for Toad, and thought that it was a great shame that a poor little animal should be locked up in prison for what seemed to her a very trivial offence. Toad, of course, in his vanity, thought that her interest in him proceeded from a growing tenderness, and he could not help half regretting that the social gulf between them was so wide, for she was a comely lass, and evidently admired him very much. One morning the girl was very thoughtful, and answered at random, and did not seem to Toad to be paying proper attention to his witty sayings and sparkling comments. Toad, she said presently, just listen, I have an aunt who is a washerwoman. There, there, said Toad, graciously and affably. Never mind, think no more about it. I have several aunts who ought to be washerwomen. Do be quiet a minute, Toad, said the girl. You talk too much, that's your chief fault, and I'm trying to think, and you hurt my head. As I said, I have an aunt who is a washerwoman. She does the washing for all of the prisoners in this castle. 
We try to keep any paying business of that sort in the family. You understand. She takes out the washing on Monday morning and brings it in on Friday evening. This is a Thursday. Now this is what occurs to me. You're very rich. At least you're always telling me so. And she's very poor. A few pounds wouldn't make any difference to you. And it would mean a lot to her. Now I think if she were properly approached, squared I believe is the word that you animals use, you could come to some arrangement by which she would let you have her dress and bonnet and so on, and you could escape from the castle as the official washerwoman. You're very alike in many respects, particularly about the figure. We're not, said the toad in a huff. I have a very elegant figure for what I am. So is my aunt, replied the girl for what she is. But have it your own way, you horrid, proud, ungrateful animal, when I'm sorry for you and trying to help you. Yes, yes, that's all right, thank you very much indeed, said the Toad hurriedly. But look here, you wouldn't surely have Mr. Toad of Toad Hall going about the country disguised as a washerwoman? Then you can stop here as a Toad, replied the girl with much spirit. I suppose you want to go off in a coach and four. Honest Toad was always ready to admit himself in the wrong. You are a good, kind, clever girl, he said. And I am indeed a proud and stupid Toad. Introduce me to your worthy aunt, if you'll be so kind. I have no doubt that the excellent lady and I will be able to arrange terms satisfactory to both parties. Next evening, the girl ushered her aunt into Toad's cell, bearing his week's washing pinned up in a towel. The old lady had been prepared beforehand for the interview, and the sight of certain gold sovereigns the Toad had thoughtfully placed on the table, in full view, practically completed the matter, and left little further to discuss. In return for his cash, Toad received a cotton print gown, an apron, a shawl, and a rusty black bonnet. The only stipulation the old lady made being that she should be gagged and bound and dumped in a corner. By this not very convincing artifice, she explained, aided by picturesque fiction which she could supply herself, she hoped to retain her situation in spite of suspicious appearance. Toad was delighted with the suggestion. It would enable him to leave the prison in some style, and with his reputation for being a desperate and dangerous fellow untarnished. He readily helped the jailer's daughter to make her aunt appear as much as possible the victim of circumstances over which she had no control. Now it's your turn, Toad, said the girl. Take off that coat and waistcoat of yours. You're fat enough as it is. Shaking with laughter, she proceeded to hook and eye him into the cotton print gown, arranged the shawl with a professional fold, and tied the strings of the rusty bonnet under his chin. You're the very image of her, she giggled. Only I'm sure you never looked half so respectable in all your life before. Now, goodbye, Toad and good luck. Go straight down the way you came up, and if anyone says anything to you, as they probably will, being but men, you can chaff back a bit, of course. But remember, you're a widow woman, quite alone in the world, with a character to lose. With a quaking heart, but as firm a footstep as he could command, Toad set forth cautiously on what seemed to be a most harebrained and hazardous undertaking. But he was soon agreeably surprised to find how easy everything was made for him, and a little humbled at the thought that both his popularity and the sex that seemed to inspire it were really another's. The washerwoman's squat figure in its familiar cotton print seemed a passport for every barred door and grim gateway, even when he hesitated, uncertain as to the right turning to take, he found himself helped out of his difficulty by the warder at the next gate. 
anxious to be off to his tea, summoning him to come along sharp and not keep waiting there all night. The chaff and the humorous sallies to which he was subjected, and to which, of course, he had to provide prompt and effective reply, formed indeed his chief danger. The toad was an animal, with a strong sense of his own dignity, and the chaff was mostly, he thought, poor than clumsy, the humour of the sallies entirely lacking. However, he kept his temper, though with great difficulty suited his retorts to his company and his supposed character. He did his best not to overstep the limits of good taste. It seemed hours before he crossed the last courtyard, rejected the pressing invitations from the last guardroom, dodged the outspread arms of the last warder, pleading with simulated passion for just one farewell embrace. But at last he heard the wicket gate in the great outer door click behind him, felt the fresh air of the outer world upon his anxious brow, and knew that he was free. Dizzy with the easy success of his daring exploit, he walked quickly towards the light of the town, not knowing in the least what he should do next, only quite certain of one thing. He must remove himself as quickly as possible from the neighbourhood where the lady he was forced to represent was so well known and so popular a character. As he walked along, considering... His attention was caught by some red and green lights a little way off, to one side of the town. The sound of the puffing and snorting of engines, the banging of shunted trucks fell on his ear. Aha, he thought, this is a piece of luck. A railway station is the thing that I want most in the whole world at the moment, and what's more, I needn't go through town to get it and shan't have to support this humiliating character by repartees which, though thoroughly effective, do not assist one's self of self-respect. He made his way to the station accordingly, consulted a timetable, and found that a train, bound more or less in the direction of his home, was due to start in half an hour. More luck, said Toad, his spirits rising rapidly, and went off to the booking office to buy his ticket. He gave the name of the station that he knew to be nearest to the village of which Toad Hall was the principal feature. Mechanically, he put his fingers in search of the necessary money where his waistcoat pocket should have been. But here the cotton gown, which had nobly stood by him so far, and which he had basely forgotten, intervened, and frustrated his efforts. In a sort of nightmare, he struggled with the strange, uncanny thing that seemed to hold his hands, turn all muscular strivings to water, and laugh at him all the time, while other travellers, forming up a line behind, waited with impatience, making suggestions of more or less value and comments or more or less stringency and point. At last, somehow, he never rightly understood how, he burst the barriers, attained the goal, arrived at where all waistcoat pockets are eternally situated, and found not only no money, but no pocket to hold it, and no waistcoat to hold the pocket. To his horror, he recollected he had left both coat and waistcoat behind him in his cell, and with them, his pocketbook, money, keys, watch, matches, pencil case, and all that makes life worth living, all that distinguishes the many-pocketed animal, the lord of creation, from the inferior one-pocketed or no-pocketed productions that hop or trip about permissively, unequipped for the real contest. In his misery, he made one desperate effort to carry the thing off, and with a return to his fine old manner, a blend of the squire and the college don, he said, Look here, I find I've left my purse behind. Just give me that ticket, will you? I'll send the money on tomorrow. I'm well known in these parts. The clerk stared at him, and the rusty black bonnet for a moment, and then laughed. I should think you were pretty well known in these parts, he said, if you've tried this game on often. Here. Stand away from the window, please, madam. 
you were obstructing the other passengers. An old gentleman who had been prodding him in the back for some moments here thrust him away, and what was worse, addressed him as his good woman, which angered Toad more than anything that had occurred that evening. Baffled and full of despair, he wandered blindly down the platform where the train was standing. Tears trickled down each side of his nose. It was hard, he thought, to be within sight of safety and almost of home, and to be balked by the want of a few wretched shillings and by the pettifogging mistrustfulness of paid officials. Very soon his escape would be discovered. The hunt would be up. He would be caught, reviled, loaded with chains, dragged back again to prison. Bread and water and straw. His guards and penalties would be doubled, and what sarcastic remarks the girl would make. What was to be done? He was not swift of foot. His figure was unfortunately recognisable. Could he not squeeze under the seat of a carriage? He had seen this method adopted by schoolboys, when the journey money provided by thoughtful parents had been diverted to other and better ends. As he pondered, he found himself opposite the engine, which was being oiled, wiped, and generally caressed by its affectionate driver, a burly man with an oil can in one hand and a lump of cotton waste in the other. "'Hello, mother,' said the engine driver. "'What's the trouble? You don't look particularly cheerful.' "'Oh, sir,' said Toad, crying afresh, "'I am a poor, unhappy washerwoman, and I've lost all my money.' and I can't pay for a ticket, and I must get home tonight somehow. And whatever I am to do, I, I don't know. Oh dear, oh dear. That's a bad business indeed, said the engine driver reflectively. Lost your money. Can't get home. Got some kids too waiting for you, I dare say. Any amount of them, sobbed Toad. They'll be hungry, playing with matches, upsetting lamps, the little innocents quarrelling, going on generally. Oh dear, oh dear. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, said the good engine driver. You're a washerwoman to your trade, says you. Very well, that's that. And I'm an engine driver, as you well may see. There's no denying that it's terribly dirty work. Uses up a power of shirts, it does, till my missus is fair tired of washing them. If you'll wash a few of my shirts for me when you get home and send them along, I'll give you a ride on my engine. It's against the company's regulations, but we're not so very particular in these out-of-the-way parts. The toad's misery turned into rapture as he eagerly scrambled up into the cab of the engine. Of course, he'd never washed a shirt in his life and couldn't if he tried. And anyhow, he wasn't going to begin, but he thought... When I get safely home to Toad Hall and have money again and pockets to put it in, I'll send the driver enough pay for quite a quantity of washing, and that'll be the same thing, or better. The guard waved his welcome flag. The engine driver whistled in cheerful response, and the train moved out of the station. As the speed increased and the Toad could see either side of him, Real fields, trees, hedges, and cows and horses all flying past him, as he thought how every minute was bringing him nearer to Toad Hall. Sympathetic friends, money to chink in his pocket and a soft bed to sleep in, good things to eat, praise, admiration at the recital of his adventures, his surpassing cleverness. He began to skip up and down and shout and sing snatches of song to the great astonishment of the engine driver, who had come across washerwomen before, but never one at all like this. They had covered many and many a mile, and Toad was already considering what he would have for supper as he got home, when he noticed the engine driver with a puzzled expression on his face, leaning over the side of the engine and listening hard. He saw him climb onto the coals and gaze out over the top of the train, and returned and said, It's very strange. We're the last train running in this direction tonight. 
I could have sworn I heard another one following us. Toad ceased his frivolous antics at once. He became grave and depressed and a dull pain in the lower part of his spine communicating itself to his legs made him want to sit down and try desperately not to think of all the possibilities. By this time, the moon was shining brightly, and the engine driver, steadying himself on the coal, could command a view of the line behind them for a long distance. Presently, he called out, "'I can see it clearly now. It is an engine.' On our rails, coming along at a great pace, it looks as if we're being pursued. The miserable toad, crouching in the coal dust, tried hard to think of something to do, with dismal want of success. They're gaining on us fast, cried the engine driver, and the engine is crowded with the queerest lot of people, men like ancient warders waving halberds, policemen in their helmets waving truncheons, shabbily dressed men in pot hats, obvious and unmistakable plain-clothed detectives even at this distance waving revolvers and walking sticks, all waving and all shouting the same thing. Stop! 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 Toad fell on his knees among the coals, and raising his clasped paws in supplication cried, Save me, only save me, dear kind Mr. Engine Driver, and I will confess everything. I am not the simple washerwoman I seem to be. I have no children waiting for me, innocent or otherwise. I am a toad, the well-known and popular Mr. Toad, a landed proprietor, and I have just escaped, by my great daring and cleverness, from a loathsome dungeon into which my enemies had flung me. And if those fellows on that engine recapture me, it will be chains and bread and water and straw and misery once more for poor unhappy innocent Toad. The engine driver looked down upon him very sternly and said, Now, tell the truth. What were you put in prison for? It was nothing very much, said poor Toad, colouring deeply. I only borrowed a motor car while the owners were at lunch. They had no need of it at the time. I didn't mean to steal it, really. But people, especially magistrates, take such harsh views of thoughtless and high-spirited action. The engine driver looked very grave and said, I fear that you have been indeed a wicked toad, and by rights I ought to give you up to the offended justice. But you are evidently in sore trouble and distress so I will not desert you. I don't hold with motor cars, for one thing, and I don't hold with being ordered about by policemen when I'm on my own engine, for another. And the sight of an animal in tears always makes me feel queer and soft-hearted. So cheer up, Toad. I'll do my best. We may beat them yet. They piled on more coals, shoveling furiously. The furnace roared, the sparks flew, the engine leapt and swung, but still their pursuers slowly gained. The engine driver, with a sigh, wiped his brow with a handful of cotton waste. He said, I'm afraid it's no good, Toad. They're running light, and they have a better engine. There's just one thing left for us to do, and it's your only chance. So attend very carefully to what I tell you. A short way ahead of us, is a long tunnel, and on the other side of that line passes through a thick wood. Now, I will put on all the speed that I can while we're running through the tunnel, but the other fellows will slow down a bit naturally for fear of an accident. When we're through, I'll shut off steam, I'll put on the brakes as hard as I can, and the moment that it's safe to do so, you must jump and hide in the wood before they get through that tunnel and see you. Then I will go full speed again, and they can chase me if they like, for as long as they like, and as far as they like. Now, be ready to jump when I tell you. They piled on more coals and the train shot into the tunnel. The engine rushed and roared and rattled till at last they shot out the other end, into fresh air and the peaceful moonlight. 
they saw the wood lying dark and helpful upon either side of the line. The driver shut off steam and put on the brakes. The toad got down on the step, and as the train slowed down to almost a walking pace, he heard the driver call out, Now, jump! Toad jumped, rolled down a short embankment, picked himself up unhurt and scrambled into the wood, and hid. Peeping out, he saw his train get up speed again and disappear at a great pace. Then out of the tunnel burst the pursuing engine, roaring and whistling, her motley crew waving their various weapons and shouting, Stop, stop, stop. When they were past, the toad had a hearty laugh for the first time since he was thrown into prison. But he soon stopped laughing when he came to consider that it was now very late and dark and cold, and he was in an unknown wood, with no money, no chance of supper, and still far from friends and home. The dead silence of everything, after the roar and rattle of the train, was something of a shock. He dared not leave the shelter of the trees, so he struck into the wood, with the idea of leaving the railway as far as possible behind him. After so many weeks within walls, he found the wood strange and unfriendly, and inclined, he thought, to make fun of him. Night jars sounding their mechanical rattle made him think the wood was full of searching warders closing in on him. An owl swooping noiselessly towards him brushed his shoulder with its wing making him jump with a horrid certainty that it was a hand, and then flitted off, moth-like, laughing. Once he met a fox, who stopped, looked him up and down in a sarcastic sort of way, and said, Hello, washerwoman. Half a pair of socks and a pillowcase short this week. Mind it doesn't occur again. And swaggered off, sniggering. Toad looked about for a stone to throw at him, but could not succeed in finding one which vexed him more than anything. At last, cold, hungry, and tired out, he sought the shelter of a hollow tree, where with branches and dead leaves, he made himself as comfortable a bed as he could, and slept soundly till the morning. <laughs>